everything's the go. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, bienvenidos, bonjour, all of you. So glad to have you here um, in our 33rd week of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. We're featuring the poets today in our new books showcase, um, whose their books have come out just before or during the pandemic or a little around there. Um, and again, we're, I'm so always so happy to be able to uh, have this platform where we can feature the new books in particular. I'm Sandy you know, and I'm your host for today. And I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. That did not come out during the pandemic, but just before in 2019. But, uh, but as I've said, Cultivating Voices uh, is, is really about featuring the voices so that we can all continue to have a platform during the pandemic. And we created the new book showcase just for that purpose, to make sure folks whose books came out um, just before or during could continue um, their readings and promoting their incredible poetry. I'm absolutely overjoyed to have you here live with us in our Zoom poetry studio, as I'm gonna start calling it. Um, and some of you are likely watching live on our Cultivating Voices page on Facebook. So we welcome the opportunity for us to double our reach of live poetry today. Well, just a little bit about Cultivating Voices live poetry. We began at the end of March in response to the shutdown, and we've developed into an international, intersectional, international uh, reading series and poetry community that now alternates weeks between a live open mic where we have eight readers with 10 minute sets each, and we have signups on Thursdays for those, and we alternate that between our new books showcase our format today. Three or four readers, 15 minute sets each by invitation, but members can request a reading if your new book has come out during the past year. We occasionally have a special event like next week, which I'll talk about at the end of today's reading. So please double check our monthly schedule at the end of each week's event page on Facebook. We're a public group all poets and beloveds of poetry are welcome to join and participate in what can what just continues to grow and grow and grow into an ever more increasing dynamic poetry community for which I'm absolutely certainly grateful. Well, now to today's new books showcase poets. I um, I really don't have words today. I don't really don't have words to talk about today how excited I am to welcome these four women poets who are not only, they've not only been friends with each other, but they also have been pillars of poetry in their communities for some immor immemorial time. I, and the four of them is Susan Eisenberg, Hilda Raz, Betsy Scholl, and Leslie Ullman. I will introduce each as they read and, um, and we will get to enjoy their amazing poetry. At the end of the reading, I'll come back with a few announcements and we will likely unmike everybody so you can show your appreciation. Here in the Poetry Zoom room, feel free to use the chat during the reading and those of you over in, in Facebook Live, feel free to do the same. Well, first is Susan Eisenberg. And Susan is the author of Quiet City from 2015, Muse from Crab Orchard Press 2002. And her newest collection is First Light, a limited edition letterpress chapbook with original lino cuts by Kevin Bowman. And that's from Gibraltar Editions. I'll be putting the link in the chat in a moment. Eisenberg lives in Iowa City and teaches in the Iowa Summer Writing Festival. Thank you so much, Susan. Welcome. And I, I'm, I can't wait to hear your reading, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, 
I'm really so happy to be uh, reading for Cultivating Voices Live. And I want to start by thanking you, Sandy, and Elizabeth Ann, and Don, for all your hard work putting this together. Um, I'm also really thrilled and honored to be reading with Betsy, Leslie, and Hilda. And so I just want to thank them. I'm just delighted. I also want to give a shout out to Denise Brady and Guy Duncan, uh, my publishers at Gibraltar Editions. Uh, here's, a, here's a shot of the book. Um, I just want to thank them for this, making this beautiful book of my work and for their support. Finally, I just, I want to thank everybody who's here. I see lots of familiar names and lots of names I don't know and people whose work I admire so much. And um, thank you everybody for being here. So I'm going to read, um, I'm not going to read too long. I'll read uh, some poems from First Light and then some new poems. Okay. I'm gonna start with a short one from First Light. And this one has a phrase in it, uh, a Yiddish phrase that I should probably translate. Um, and that is fine mention. And that translates as fine people, fine men. It's usually used pretty heavily ironically um, as it is here. And this is dedicated to my late mother, Edith Singer. The television. Until very near the end, it played and played. Paternity court followed by Judge Judy in the afternoon. Fine a mention, you'd say, tisk tisking and laughing at the unfaithful men and small time grifters, shaking your weak head at this crazy new world. Nights there were movies or docs on PBS, though you mostly missed the endings, adrift on morphine and Xanax. Only when you began in earnest the hard work of your dying did it start to annoy. The night nurse who could not stay awake complained she had to have it on, though it startled you from sleep, confused and afraid. We let her go. M and I kept the volume low in the dim study, the one room without hospice supplies, our guilty oasis, except for the desk, its deepening stacks of paperwork, sticky notes, and the phone numbers of emergency. Door cracked to hear you, we'd binge on the wire, grateful for the hoppers and murder police, the ticking row houses and alleys become a place where we could rest a while in the pulse of electric blue light. We'd watch till it lulled us a little until we could almost sleep. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> You're the only one I can see, by the way. So I don't know if I have this how I'm supposed to, but <sighs> okay. This uh, next one's called Shamika. One generation past island, Shamika wears a heavy wig of waist length dreads, hammered silver hoops the size of small hotcakes. She stands beside my mother lying in her hospital bed and sings Etta James a cappella. At last, my love has come along. My lonely days are over and life is like a song. Oh yeah. And this bedroom converted to hospice use. My mother's queen bed become a work table and storage space for diapers and stacks of paperwork. Her doily covered dresser top now cluttered with narcotics and syringes. The family photos in their silver frames obscured by boxes of plastic gloves and the glass beakers into which three times a week the nurses drain toxic fluid from her lungs stills. And there's only Shamika's soulful alto, the regular hiss thump of the oxygen machine and the sharp trill of Pablo and Garbo, mom's cockatoos singing along. Dust motes rise like clouds on a pale shaft of Florida sunlight piercing the morning shadows. And the room trembles as if it too might rise, might lift us to that paradise Shamika says awaits us. First light. In the siren's wail, 
in the leaves green trembling, in the rhythmic pounding the workers make this morning, building new houses up the block. In the sweet apple I eat, dark coffee sputtering the pot, in my own heavy legs curled on this yellow couch, in the starry night throw a fond student stitched for me, another love I did not earn. In shovel scrape, in its echo, in the dirt we scooped and dropped onto your grave in sullen Florida sun. In my own death, idling at the station just ahead. In my beloved's chanting a last prayer close to your ear, you come to me, you come wasting, come sick. Your skin like faded paper, you come smiling at the first light your face has known in weeks in your leaving, in your hand, cooling in my hand. Um, I'm going to read some new poems now and uh, starting with this next one. And this is a big shift in tone. Uh, this poem is after a wonderful poem uh, of John Weir's called The Beautiful American Word Guy. And my poem is called The Beautiful American Word, Baby. Once I wanted it growled low in the throat by a Steve McQueen lookalike as he pulled me down for a long, slow kiss. Me in my Liz Taylor satin slip, him in his tight t-shirt and low slung jeans, some steamy motel night. Babe would do for more domestic moments. Hey babe, have you got a second? Not quite so good, but still clear as a ring or my name tattooed on a bicep. Keep away, girls. Taken. No sweetheart, no sugar for my dream lover. Too many high-pitched consonants, too easy for sales clerks and sarcasm, too Southern. Only baby sounded like whiskey and leather jackets, the backs of Harleys, James Dean and young Brando, pointy-toed boots of worn, soft Spanish leather. Honey was for drag queens and sitcom husbands, jokey as a big wig and falsies, homely as Schlitz and socks on the bedroom floor. Doll reeked of menace, cold eyes, hard slap, sharp flick of a switchblade. Deer was unthinkable, Ozzy and Harriet, virginal librarians who hadn't yet transformed by taking off their glasses and letting down their hair. Baby it had to be, appreciative as a whistle from the young hard hats in summer, breeze ruffling a cotton skirt on bare legs. Baby was dangerous, sexy hitters perched on car hoods, hot Coney Island nights in July, signal clear as any other animal's call. Baby was, I want you, a warm hand cupping a naked breast, a palm sliding down a man's taut stomach, musky sheets, quickened pulse. I was too young to question baby, as in child, as in mine. Not your baby reads the t-shirt on the young woman I passed on the street today. And of course she's right. Even back then it was mostly a bad joke. Who can remember every chick's name, man? Or habit, a tick, no more meaningful than a pecked cheek goodbye. Still, at 16, it seemed to me beautiful. Sleepy green eyes behind Ray-Bans, a cocked cowboy hat. Thank you, Sandy. Monday. This morning, it's the man lifting his bike across the railroad tracks, passing it up and over the chain link fence like an awkward companion, and then riding off, a dark figure heading towards the vanishing point of the concrete canvas I fancy St. Mary's parking lots become. It's in these gusts that ferry the weeds and the three target bags blousy and transparent as jellyfish across the tracks and the deserted lot behind him. And in the susurrus of traffic rolling over the I-35 overpass, where yesterday my student Kay drove beneath the crooked legs of a man poised to drop, 
the way a swimmer might slip the pebbled edge of some suburban pool. He didn't, but still, she writes, she felt her life divide between the moment his shadow fell across her windshield and all the ones to follow. I think it must have been in the voices of the cops who coaxed him down and in their pulsing squad car lights, in the eyes of the passersby. I can feel it now in the rising breeze troubling the switchgrass and the chimes strung from our porch. It's in the stray cat making for the light and sound leaking from our windows, in the robin watching. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read uh, just two more. And this one um, is called Errata and it's after Gerald Stern. What I took to be a slim wire lost on the pavement turned out to be a tiny snake that whipped itself around the panicked toe of my kindergarten saddle shoe. What I believed the smoke from a swallowed cigarette burning in a young bully's belly turned out to be only the mist of his breath rising on the chilly air of a foreign cold snap one rare North Miami morning. It turned out to be a stone outside our window, not a dead deer curled beneath the oak. And that cry through the bedroom wall was not a hungry baby, but only our neighbor's cat left too long alone. That bite from some nasty bug off the Smith Corona floor blackening the skin beneath my jeans turned out to be a third shift splash of the sulfuric acid it was my job to dip the metal parts in. And that closet I discovered jerry-rigged from textbooks around my son's third grade desk, a small prison his teacher built to wall him off when he couldn't stop talking out of turn. It wasn't a starburst we saw that summer evening as we left the theater, just a woman's sunstruck hair. At first we thought it was snow falling on the camps and trains in the famous movie. Those ashes I learned were the words a friend would speak one day, explaining to me the transgressions of the Jews. And what I thought the face of love forever turned out to be heat shimmering like water on a distant blacktop tar rising and then cracking like my own lustful, fickle heart. Okay, this is the, thank you. This is the, the last poem. A Walk with Frank O'Hara. This morning I'm thinking of Frank O'Hara strolling the streets of Manhattan debonair in white flannels, a small notebook in one pocket, an egg and tomato sandwich wrapped in wax paper in another. He stops at a newsstand, plucks a times from the counter, buys a strong coffee. Frank skims the headlines, then takes his lunch to Washington Square, a place I'd come to know well a decade later, as a girl of 15 wearing beads and feathers in my long braid, those days my friends and I patrolled the village, eager for Dylan sightings, careful of the twitchy speed freaks panhandling on the east side. These days I'd be lost there as any tourist, gawking at the locals and the new condos shadowing the avenues. O'Hara sits on the same smooth rim of the fountain where we perch to flirt with strangers, giddy at cutting class. Unlike us, Frank's urbane, très cool, even as he sips his coffee, chews his sandwich, and squints up at the sun. Maybe he's considering which clubs to hit tonight, or where to dine before catching the new Truffaut. He opens his notebook and writes his sure lines in an elegant hand. Here, there are no newsstands, and the shops are closed, some for good, the streets downtown deserted as an empty movie set and as sad. I walk the bridge over the Iowa River, wary behind my mask of those who come too close. I'm trying to forget the morning's news, 
the 200 at a house party in Beverly Hills, the 250,000 riders in Sturgis, the virus dirtying the air each time they laugh. One writer warns that this is how we end, not by contagion, but because we no longer care for each other. I stop and look out over the river, imagine O'Hara and me walking together in the city and it's spring and we can smell the salted pretzels and boiled hot dogs from the vendors carts, the bright flowers circling the plane trees. It's still the ugly fifties, but the Kennedys, King and Malcolm X are still alive and neither one of us knows anyone who's left real life for Vietnam. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much. Uh, wow, I, can, I so can relate to so much of the final poem. Uh, thank you, incredible. Sandy. Obviously, you're getting a lot of love from the chat so oh i haven't uh, i haven't been looking at it that later. <laughs> yes, i know i know you get to see that later thank you i want to say that um i can see your words on the pages of prairie schooner which is where i would have read your work for the very first time i could see your name in the masthead a very distinctive font that I've become accustomed to over the years and see your poems in those when I was reading them for the first time. So to get to hear the words come off the page for me is quite an extraordinary thing. Oh, thank so you so thank much. You. Thank you. Um, so one of Susan's books is Quiet City, a, a beautiful, beautiful collection that I happen to have here in my house. Of course, I'll be adding First Light very shortly to my collection. And Thank folks, you. the links to Susan's books are in the chat. Well, the person that was responsible for including Susan's work in Prairie Schooner, where I saw Susan's poems for the first time, is our next reader. Hilda Raz's new and collected poems will be out in June 2021 from, not surprisingly, the University of Nebraska Press. Her new collection that she's reading from today, List and Story, was published in March and is available from Barnes and Noble and Amazon, as well as your local independent bookstore. You can write to Hilda. Uh, she, if you go and look at her bio, she's provided her email. And if you write to her, she'll send you an autographed copy without postal costs for $18. That's the peddler in me. <laughs> saying that. Hilda is the poetry editor for Bosque po Press and the editor of the poetry series and the editor of the poetry series at the University of New Mexico Press. Would you please welcome the incomparable Hilda Raz. Wow. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Don. Thank you all for being here. I recognize so many names and I'm, I'm so grateful to Sandy for talking about List and Story, which is new. I'm so glad to be here with this quartet of poets and how lucky I feel to be among them. The idea for List and Story was a simple obsession a book of catalog poems and a book of narrative poems. What can these forms say about and to each other in writing poetry? They're the forms I most love. One seems exhaustive on the one hand, narrative stories, and the other suggestive, the catalog poem, the list. 
I thought I'd begin today with a long poem called The Spa of the Three Widows. It's on page two for those of you who have the book. I imagine here three friends, three writers who meet every summer to write together and to rest and to cavort. After many years, though the women are not old, they become widows. The speaker here, the observer, is one of them, yet not. I'll read four poems from the sequence, and it's really a poem about friendship. The Spa of the Three Widows. At lunch this year, as anyone can see, or I do draped in a black shawl, that these friends have lost on the grief diet, the weight of one healthy adult man, the one missing from each of their sides of the patio table where we're sitting. They bend together over their burgers, chopped beef or vegetable and salad, no wine this time, to discuss the past year when their husbands have taken by the hand death and been dispatched by his tools, disease for one, collapse for another, and for the third, a fall from a cliff. Behind my shawl, I speculate about the sulfur tubs in the meadow beyond the patio where we dine. A specific, said the brochure, for a bad back. Too much to carry, I think, listening to the widows. The widows shop for makeup at Sephora. They wear shorts and sweatshirts with the name of our beach embroidered on their pockets, two navy, one sea blue. They turn up their shiny faces to the sales girl for the application of color to their eyelids. They are absolutely still, seated on cretan stools so the scarlet, zinced purples, buff and tan can be applied close to their lashes. Their eyes are transformed all green and blue iris as they open to the fluorescent light. They buy brushes thin as a fingernail in a kit for travel and blush compact set with gold filigree. Then they blot the sore places under their eyes with Kleenex. A widow weeps. Ophelia wears Mephisto sandals that rub her foot sore over a vein, a big pain that seems to erode her calm. Later in the car, while others go into the drugstore for bandages to cover, I loosen the strap on her shoe by a notch. From the back seat, she says, don't speak, then wails. I am stone silent as instructed. But when her small hand pushes between the seats, I take it and hold on. Her pain shudders between us. What will I do? I say all the fragments of the prayers I know to beg for the edges to dull. Artemisia returns with a bag. Cleo unpeels the tape positions the gauze and presses silence. Then we go on to the beach. The widow's dance. The waves have been flat all afternoon, the sky a dulled mirror. We have lain in the light for hours, protected by hats and towels and shirts. We have slept and talked and now we are walking and looking down to find stones in the shapes of hearts or those wishing stones with halos stretched front to back or up and down or the flat ones for skipping on water. 
I pick up the ones most resembling fudge with stripes of coconut that we buy in the shops, sweet to hold under the tongue. We have walked along the wet sand until the white cliff in the distance is just above us and the tide pool has filled with muscle, a swirl that pulls us back hard. We hold on and push back. In the distance, one widow is dancing. The sun has come out and makes of the vi this vista a dazzle but we can see her flirting with the waves. Maybe he is there under the surface. Maybe she can see him or maybe she is alone. We reach to hold hands and run to join her. First days back. I come home from the beach to my spouse who is alive and vigorous. Thereafter, two days of antibiotics. The spring comes on. Each day arrives in a shower of pollen. The birdbath water is covered. The Norfolk pines put out for the season are packed at the forks with yellow. Everywhere, birds, robins, cardinals. One flew at the windshield as I turned into our driveway, a streak of flame. And here, should follow the list, omissions. All night thunder, lightning, dreams, and hard rain. My wedding bands look so simple, worn down. Should I put back the bright stone beside them? My morning horoscope counsels patience. I'm sitting at the keyboard in my black shawl a nightdress of cotton and nothing more. Black shoes with orthopedic arches. Three rings. Okay, now I'm going to read a poem called Go. And it's on page 11, go. The year I was 18, 12 months of love, magic and leaves I stretched for, reaching upward to pause in early dark on Boylston Street, walking to Charles Gate East, the year I turned 18, alive in Hebrew numerology as my father died. How leaves that autumn brighten their yellows and reds to color light overhead each day on my walk home. I carried the future with me, damp, luminous, sticky, redolent. Still, my father died. What can I know of solitude, of stillness that season, the sprint of life, the pain, of arriving. Okay, now I'm going to read Nick Spencer, Two Days Dead, page 55. Some of you here may remember Nick Spencer. I thought about changing his name, but I couldn't. Nick Spencer, Two Days Dead. He took himself Richard says at dinner, a shrimp boil and we sausage, steamed corn and new potatoes, high summer. Moonflowers stud the bushes each side of the front door, moist blossoms seeming too heavy to open. To the left on entering and above your head, tiny white flowers, are they moonflowers too? A variant full open? So when Richard says later over pear ices, next life is different, he means next human life, doesn't he? In the backyard from the dining room window, bittersweet climbs, both male and female, established enough to go on bearing, as Richard says, through generations of us. 
On the table, platters of clay hold shrimp in mounds, pink and golden corn cobs broken into servings and pale browns, the potatoes like nipples. So many subjectivities, shifting portals made of layers like silk and milk caught and broken through to the next layer like petals, like berries. And we here together talking, swaying forward to try to bring ourselves home. This is the past and the future. This is really for John Link, my son, older son. The past and the future. Once I wore a dress of iridescent icy peau de soie. The sleeves were sheared short on my dark arms. After a season, salt rotted the silk into pure blue. Yesterday on Skype, I talked to you for an hour. You looked like a Whitman sampler lid, all color blocks, modern art and candy, a grid. You stayed together through shifts of pixels. You abroad, me at home. Last night, great flashes and percussion in our sky. If I should lose the accompaniment, I would stop. No rest, but symbols, then silence. Aaron Raz Link, who is here, and I were commissioned to make a sculpture and a poem a collaboration. His sculpture was a box made of plexiglass with individual clear compartments inside and closed with a hasp on a door. Inside in each compartment were individual letters made of lead, a heavy dark substance, but they were in no alphabet we'd ever seen. He put one in each compartment. And this is the last poem I'll read. It's on page 72 in List and Story. And this, of course, is for Aaron Link, Aaron Raslink. Um, it has an epigraph from Jane Hirschfield. An alphabet's molecules tasting of honey, iron, and salt cannot be counted. This is a catalog poem too. You'll hear catalog of the letters and what I think they are. Our life in minerals, wrote the poet to call up the patient sea. He stands on sand called shore, salt mustache. The letters come, are caught, arranged, erase. Here then is my life in letters, a great weight. A metal alphabet meaning nothing one can decipher. Patience calls out the poet from the margins. One letter, like a chair, flexes toes. One is a sigh. I have tried all my life to carry weight from the margins to the center, one letter then another until the click of the box says stop. See the hasp of the lock on the transparent door. See the shadows. Is one a belt buckle? A woman swimming? One arm of a scissors, a chair, a man waving, a clown in a backbend, dog behind a bolt. Zzzz, says the guard in the box as he bows his pregnant, pregnant belly behind Cocopelli to make an urn. Shadows move to ease light from the museum windows. Soon we will find the metal key. Again, the poet brushes salt into glowing shapes. Soon the fires will light and we will return to mineral. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you all for listening.
Thank you so much, Hilda. I, every time I hear you read, it's, it is hard for me to not get choked up, I have to say. So, you know, I like to be real with folks, even though we're on Zoom. I like to share what's really in my heart. So thank you. I'll see you soon. And folks, I'm putting in the link uh, in the chat how to purchase Hilda's books and rem a reminder that you can purchase List and Story, her 14th collection, I believe. Um, uh, you can buy it directly from her as well. She'll sign it and there it is if you email her. So thank you, Hilda, again. Our next, what a, what, a, what, a, what a gift today, these poets that we have in our new books showcase. And what a gift to have all of you in the Zoom room with us uh, for the for Zoom Poetry Studio for the first time. Uh, I'm really enjoying uh, being with everyone. Well, our next poet joining us from New England, where I'm originally from, is Betsy Scholl. Betsy Scholl's ninth collection of poetry is House of Sparrows, new and selected poems from the University of Wisconsin. It was the winner of the Four Lakes Prize. Betsy teaches in the MFA in writing program at Vermont College of Fine Arts and served as poet laureate of Maine from 2006 to 2011. What I so appreciate about these four women is their, their modesty. Their bios could go on forever. And what they've chosen to share with us is just a compact version of what they've accomplished. So it is my um, deep pleasure to welcome Betsy Scholl. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you, Sandy, and everyone involved in putting this together and Don for, I hope Don, the storm's passed. And uh, it's just an honor to read with um, these three fabulous poets. I'm just so moved by each of you and so grateful to be, um, to know you and, and to be part of this. Um, because the books are new and selected, I thought I would read one older poem and, and then a couple of the new poems from the book and then one or two newer poems. So this first poem is, uh, comes out of teaching in a prison poetry workshop and it's um, a villanelle, sort of loose, a loose villanelle. It's called Doing Time. They call me babe and make a kissing noise from inside their bars and inside their rage. Most of them are men, though they act like boys who've played too hard and broken all their toys. Now they're trying to break their metal cage. They yell out, babe, make that loud kissing noise as if their cat calls mean they have a voice routines and bells can't break. It's just a phase their parents must have said when they were boys. Don't ask what they're in for. Let them enjoy their small audience, their short time on stage. Hey, babe, how about then that kissing noise? In class, they want to rhyme. Their way to destroy all evidence of anguish on the page. They can't bear to remember being boys. Some study law, some do another ploy, daydreaming they'll do time but never age. Hey babe means kiss off to that cell block noise, to broken men in here since they were boys. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this next poem um, 
is set in the Appalachian Mountains where we lived for seven years. And um, it's, it's kind of addressed to my son when he was young. Um, we had been through a fire and a flood. So um, those things come into the poem. And we lived in a, a trailer after the flood. And I'm sort of very happy that I could get a trailer into a poem. So the title is the first line too. One night the wind got wild, then wilder, and what were we thinking? A school night, our whole yard getting tossed as if the wind had a warrant. But something to see, the full moon sailing through clouds, the biggest wind we'd ever known. Young as you were, you'd been through fire and flood, then this cornfield and our new tin house, a fairy tale world of cows and bluebirds, unlocked doors, wide fields surrounded by hills. So we crooned, wake up to your sleep soft face. Do you remember? That wind we could spread our arms and practically ride. We didn't want you to think wolf licking its lips, puffing at roof tiles, the world howling down the chimney, saying what fodder we were. You stood in the doorway, rubbing your eyes as old rags flapped up and the plastic on the wood pile ripped free. Slowly, you grinned and began to twirl with us in the moonstruck stubble. Our night clothes belled in the wind, fistfuls, armfuls, what straw to hurl. My sleepy darling, we wanted to give you a different tale, milkweed wands and a world happy to huff itself up. As close as we'll ever get to flight, those lawn chairs clattering down the road, the cow gate groaning, and the straps that held our trailer down, twanging like an eerie guitar. Um, thank you. This next poem, I'm, I hope I'm not rattling my papers too much. This next poem is in three parts <laughs> and um, it's called Walking Paradise Blues and it's got three characters in it. It's got the poet Dante, who's a bit of an obsession for me and the blues harp player, Big Walter Horton and my grandmother. Walking Paradise Blues. Bitter another man's salty bread, Lord, Lord, bitter the climb up somebody else's stairs. Dante sings a kind of terzarima blues. In our time, it could be Jimmy Rogers walking by myself, hope you understand, backed up on the harp by big Walter Horton, who played Chicago streets on warehouse break for tips from lunchtime execs come slumming. No harmonica cup to the mic for Dante. No train whistle wail, battered guitar whine. Still, he got down, got low down, talking back to the city's shut gate. Knew how the spit, you have to tap out, tipping the harp. First, you have to pour in. White as she was, and more English than that, my grandma knew the blues. What spit I got, I got from her wet kisses. Got the blues from how she asked her brother, big time doc, said, my pockets are empty, can you lend a hand? And he, with the six servants, Cadillac wife, sent her a 20, cash, no note. Bitter, the spit she swallowed, saying thanks. Bitter the bills unpaid, flickering lights. But sweet, those gut bucket blues, big Walter wailed, and she hummed along as she trudged, stuck self and hell sludge to light. Oh, yeah. Sweet, those jelly arms, lips happy to smooch. Never had to knock twice on grandma's door. 
Good welcome was Dante's paradise too, walking those dark blues into starry light. Play the street when the record deal don't come, Big Walter must have told himself. For grandma, it was give all you got. And she gave more even to birds than her brother ever had. I'm witness to the wispy hair she pulled from her brush, then leaned out the window for those high flyers to swoop in and snatch. Soul I'm talking about. What big Walter blew through bent notes, lonely, so you know somebody's been down that road before. Lord, they sang, wore out how many shoes, one eye fixed on the grit, one on the stars. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, I thought I would read the title poem uh, from, from this book, House of Sparrows. And um, I, I, I wrote it during the, the height or the depth of, of the um, war in Syria. And there are some quotes, um, you, I think you'll know their quotes, um, that they're mostly from the, the Bible, so, but they've been changed. This is called House of Sparrows. What if every time we saw the word sorrow, we switched it to sparrow? For my life is spent with sparrows, with drunkenness and sparrows, or, if it went the other way, the song would be, his eye is on the sorrow. My eyes on the neighbor's eaves and the copper roofed house we put up in our yard. It's many rooms, multiple nests, generations, as if we brought this clamor on ourselves, this hurdy-gurdy rabble, host and quarrel of sparrows mixed with the morning radio, broadcasting a bombed hospital, bodies under fallen roof tiles, shards of overvoice and wailing, while outside birds flare up, knock each other off the feeder, sparrows the color of rubble, of dust and mud, burnt cars, blown out windows, of wreckage they could roost in, the earth a house of sparrows on Sparrow Street, hunger house, and woe to the poor who are spared nothing, who gather at borders to beg and for forage, are sold two for a penny, five for two cents. And yet, doesn't it say the Lord God attends, bends down to each one shot starved, buried in rubble, a man of sparrows, acquainted with grief, who says, when I bow my head, sparrows are better than laughter. And to the rabble, the wailing, the how, the when, who says, your sparrows will turn to joy. <laughs> Oh, I got a birdie. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> well, you may have heard partway through that poem, a little stammer. I'm a stutterer and you never know when it might come up. So I'm going to read two more poems. Uh, the first one is a prose poem. And um, I, I actually, my daughter who's come to help with the dog is here and she appears in this poem. Uh, as a boy's mother. Uh, and the first four words are the hand of God. And that's a quote the speaker hears somebody saying, I, I hope that's clear. Okay, birthday party, Fairy Beach. The hand of God on the lips of a bikinied woman as she trudges through the sand with a friend could be wind or a burning tree, a stranger brushing her shoulder or maybe a kind of answer to the boy, newly 10, who's just asked if being grown up is hard. What to say? 
even the history of these stones tossed by waves and now skipped across them by the boy may include fire, ice, crushed ferns. So little is straightforward. First the kiss he gave his mother, then his squirm out of her arms back to the water. Whoever said love isn't complicated, if he wasn't a fool, must have passed through some burning gate found only by those who have stopped trying to grasp or explain. How to tell the boy, none of us, when we agreed to breathe, crawl, walk, read, knew the journey would not reveal itself in advance. So our best maps are dreams, Escher-like roads that dissolve then reappear, looped through tilting scaffolds. But never mind, never mind. Now the boy's mother photographs the sky, slant of clouds rippled and glowing, a sermon in which awe overwhelms uncertainty and dread has no place here where low tide reflects the splendor overhead. Yes, the sky will dissolve its radiant path as if to say looking elsewhere is not the answer. This will turn into that, cake into crumbs, bright wrappings into balled up trash. And yes, it is hard, but there are gifts, child, gifts, you among them. Uh, and this is my last, thank you. This is my last poem and uh, uh, Hilda wrote about widows and I have recently become one myself. So this is a poem kind of in honor of my husband, his shaving cuts. He loved winter, I should just say, um, I don't understand it, but he did love winter, his shaving cuts. His shaving cuts, his big brow bones, that quick smile. He stands in the doorway under the skylight in a freak shine of sun, snow bright. The whole city is blinded. Shovelers out in their shades on every street bend and toss dangerous pavement. But not to him, schoolboy grin, bits of tissue stuck to his cheek. He's thinking, no work, snow day, and where are my gators? Then a quick kiss and out the door. Shush of his skis gliding down the street past the stench and groan of snow blowers. Where does spirit live? Can it be held in language? in giddy words unhindered like the twittering of birds, not rules but joy where I see only work. This kind of breaking and entering I can take, him stepping into snowshine, even if it so welcomes, so blazes around him, there's no way back. Thank you. <laughs> wow just absolutely beautiful betsy thank you so much folks i have put the link in the chat to betsy shoals um, ninth collection house of sparrows new and selected poems you know i want to send my condolences to you as well uh, all the more reason that I'm so grateful for you to join us. Um, and, a, and what a display of what I think all of us know, which is that, you know, poetry is w one of the few things that I know that has the capacity to truly hold joy and grief simultaneously uh, and all our emotions, which is why I, which is why I love poetry so much, is that it's grand capacity to hold the human experience. Thank you again, Betsy. What, a, what an incredible um, honor to have you here with us today. Well, these readings always go faster 
then I think they're going to go. But I, I try to explain that to folks, like it goes quickly. Uh, and, and now here we are with our final reader. Oh. Well, our final reader today is Leslie Allman. And I wanna, again, as I said, these, these women are so modest about themselves in their bio. I, I probably should have doubled the bio allotment of words. Um, but I wanted to share with you something that Leslie doesn't have in her bio, which is Leslie's first book was Natural Histories, which won the Yale series of younger poets. And I, um, when I was at Nebraska, I would go into Hilderaz's office and marvel at all the poetry books that were assembled there and hope that one day I could have a collection of poetry as illustrious as those I saw on Hilda's bookcases. I may be right, I may be, I might, I may be getting there. I may be getting there. And, um, and so I'm so, I'm, but I'm so thrilled to have these books that have often been long out of print um, and particularly of one of the most famous readings reading series to be published in and entry into a world of poetry to be able to win the Yale series of younger poets. So I'm really thrilled to have that collection, which also happens to have a foreword by one of my favorite poets, Richard Hugo. So back to the present tense. Leslie Allman has published five poetry collections and a book of craft essays, Library of Small Happiness. Leslie is a former university professor and she is, a firm, she is on a former university professor. She is on the faculty of the low residency MFA program at Vermont College of Fine Arts. And you can find all of her work on her website, which we'll be putting in the chat. Welcome, Leslie. I'm so glad you're here to close out our wonderful quartet today. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, this is an amazing series. I'm super impressed. Um, I was impressed after you contacted me and now I'm seeing what you all do and it's so exciting. Um, I, I don't see myself on full screen. Does that matter? I don't need to. Is it working out? Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here with three friends and women I admire so much. Um, I thank, I'm, thank you all, and I also want to thank the publisher of the book I'm going to read from. The poems are actually, I wrote them a while ago, but the book was accepted by a publisher who kind of was getting uninterested in actually publishing anything and he ended up closing up shop and I didn't know about it. None of his writers knew about it. And then Nine Mile Press, uh, wonderful little press edited by a friend of mine from grad school, Rob, Bob, Her oh, Bob Hertz. He accepted the book quickly and he brought it out quickly and it's a really pretty cover. Quilt artists did the cover, and I'm very grateful to them for bringing out these poems. Um, they are a sequence. The first poem was sort of randomly begun, and as I progressed, I would just take the ending of the previous poem and make it the first line or the title of the following poem, and I ended up with a whole series that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to read these in pairs. Um, what I've just what I realized about the book after I was all done was that it actually had an arc, which I wasn't aware of. So I want to try to read the arc. Um, but along the way, I have to say this sounds like a very autobiographical book. But after the first poem, I started making up a lot of stuff. And I, I ended up feeling like I was having a conversation with a double 
It was not me, sort of me, but not me. And it was very fun. And um, this double does think about a lot of different things, sort of things that nobody else is interested in. Um, but there's also a series of concerns that, that seem to come out. So I'm, that's how I've selected what I'm going to read to you. Um, the first one was started by a random thing I came across. It was a Facebook question. What do you remember about 1987? A divorce. My friends and I seeking higher versions of ourselves in sweat lodges, hypnosis, and Sufi dancing. Phyllis, Monica, Kelly, Ken. Red wine days, vegetarian days. Madonna, Michael Jackson, and the noisy hum of a Capro 16 as words flowed through my fingers in green. MS-DOS, the new frontier. A 40th birthday, potluck with margaritas, friends wandering into the nearby fields with poems on their breath, and me held briefly in the glow of new perfect love. Kathleen, Sandra, Terry, Renee. I drove a Toyota Tercel and wore long beaded earrings. Listened to a Walkman while riding Burley along the Mesa, picking spines out of my heart and moving under a shroud of promises to myself I had broken. One night, I found a rattlesnake in my house. Hollowed out and ready for rebirth by the end of the year, I learned to breathe out angers I could touch and sorrows I didn't know had been hiding. The breathing got deeper. The snake got away. You too, Whitney Houston, the Moody Blues. The breathing was like digging with a sharp stick and the peeling away of masks. Masks. Feathers in the hair, <clears throat> midnight above the lashes, thigh-high boots, rooms filled with the shimmer of wind chimes, the anguish of Coltrane, the water and leaf filtered light of Satie. I read the story of O oh, and didn't like it, but something made me reach for the chords it missed. Desire as black diamond, not quite danger. Sometimes I watched Lawrence Welk for a furtive return to my mid-century childhood, embalmed as it was in the syrup of his careful English, the accordions and bland lyrics, so much smiling and blondness, innocence tenacious as tar. I cringed with embarrassment and longing. My nature made no sense to me, nor did the future. I was like everyone I knew. I preferred foods I couldn't recognize, bite-sized, jewels on, scattered on trays in minimally furnished salons I could only imagine. Even the hosts dressed in black and ate standing up. Soft lighting soothed their bisque walls from which my imagination withdrew its own clutter. I conjured places where I could imagine starting over. <clears throat> Here's another little couple of linked poems. This one is return. Return can, can mean to turn again or make the same turn twice or trace a spiral that moves at once inward and outward. You can bend your attention either way. Both directions appear improbably at once, the way an Escher print shows water flowing seamlessly upward and down. Don't ask, just let something like vertigo wash over you, quelling whatever you knew of time or logic until sensation is all. Something of a drugged state. And sometimes it's your past 
that circles back in waves to converse with your present. A slow dance with partners you discover you can trust. No great loves, no awkward groping or sweaty palms, each old heartbreak now blunt edged and forgettable. You've been around this block and perhaps are moving closer to the you that all along has housed you. The you that all along has housed you. The you that all along has housed you was once a druid, an unwed mother, a teller of white lies, and a friar's apprentice. Prefers movement to meditation, altitude to ocean. Has no tolerance for overhead lighting, but is drawn like a crow to glittery things, also to spiral shaped things can read people like tea leaves, but can't find the scissors or the milk or clean socks, even when they're in plain sight. Was once a painter inside a cave and a healer slipping quiet as a spider from a wooden hut at dawn. Knows how to work leather and name the gemstones. Knows that a teak bowl is not the right vessel for holding coins grew angry at God lifetimes ago, heartbroken, died broken, and now gropes its way life after life towards a light it still can't define. Sandy, you have such a nice bedside manner. I love seeing you on my screen. Um, so this next couple of poems, I realize that last one is past lives and this poem is sort of mulling over future lives. I think my speaker thinks she's a guest in this lifetime, that it's she's visiting this lifetime from a strange, strange land. I have a cat in my lap, I'm getting rid of him. Next time around, I will master the pirouette and the splits before the age of six. In this life, it was the headstand. Or learn to type before I can write. Or climb from my first glimpse of a river bearing a clay jar of water on my head. My head proud on its stalk, the water supple, alive in its enclosure. I might hear an ancient song rising unbidden in my throat. Or play a small spring stringed instrument while perched in a tree beside the river, singing with the river in its own language, having stepped without looking back into the life I've been given in a country whose small change flows through my hands and whose ways are the air I breathe without knowing I breathe. I will not have to be taught to dance. I will feel easy with beasts or elsewhere altogether with the circuits inside slender electronic devices and the invisible chambers of the gigabyte. For a long time, I will have few regrets alive in that time and place until my voice, my limbs, my thoughts begin to reach as though towards greater light, towards whatever else I might have done but didn't. Whatever else I might have done but didn't, I have managed not to do harm, unless mosquitoes count and ants when they appear next to the canisters on my white counter, black grains of them smaller than rice, vaporized under the sponge with my hand on it, and the centipede I once found in the leg of my jeans, and the snake I mistook for a rattler stretched across my doorway. I went for the bladed shovel, and that I do regret, with what has become a residual ache of the stab, the torrent, the what have I done that doubled me over? I have done harm. And now I recall my repeated failures to walk in the shoes of someone who hurt me or pissed me off or lied to me. 
failures to praise, failures to listen, failures to get in a bully's face, failures to pick up the phone in a spirit of welcome, failures to meet the eyes of a panhandler at an intersection, even as I noted the hard beauty of bone beneath his weathered cheek. What will my face reveal about me when I'm too old to rearrange it, when I've really forgotten, when I am no longer at my own mercy, what little of it I tended? What shape will mercy take then, and where will it come from? I have done harm. It has gone around and come around, but sometimes it rearranged itself into lessons I could read. In the reading, I let myself double over and be flooded, speared and washed clean. In the reading, at least for those moments, I was harmless. <clears throat> in my one heart, in my one heart, I have lived as two people one more fearless than the other, one who prefers to stay at home and then is the last to leave a party, one mostly helpless, one myopic, one with a green thumb, one who every morning burns the bacon. Both have trouble getting caps off jars. One can hold a sulk with practiced tenacity one can mimic any sound a cat makes, though she doesn't understand what's been said. One prefers black. One experiments lately with coral. One has taught herself to like cheap scotch. One prefers any wine whose description includes the word velvet. One has never married. One has married four times. One likes men. The other likes men. One likes them one at a time and far between. One has never mastered eyeliner. One says she can't paint and won't try. One can paint because she doesn't care and because making a mess is liberating as long as it's not on her face. One is good at finding small objects on the ground. She is the myopic one. The one who burns bacon may be the one whose perennials come back every spring. The one who likes black has been known to wear turquoise. It has become hard to determine who is who. And in fact, there may be more than two. One heart evidently is not large enough to give everyone a room of her own. Her own. Owning. This is hard for women of a certain generation, mine. Or maybe it's just the apology gene women of all ages have hidden somewhere. I watch myself disown on autopilot as though I might ward off censure by censoring myself first, smoothing in advance the ways my voice might make. Maybe I need a bark collar that zings a soft spot every time I demure and start to shrink wrap some part of myself. Not a jolt, just a subtle reminder that I'm doing something more painful and painful for a longer time than anything a bit of voltage can do. How would it feel to move through the world without this ploy at self-protection as say, a firstborn son, or a drill sergeant, or an English don. To assert a position or give an order as though it were expected. I can barely imagine being able to disguise uncertainty, waiting it out, though I can guess this has its own way of being no fun. Perhaps the male counterpart to my caller would prompt a man to open an interchange with a question or speculation. 
get over it, I say and say to myself, chewing over this bone well into the night, while the lovely man I am cleaved to puts up with my leaving all the lights on after he has gone to bed. These last two poems are the last two poems in the book. They're fairly short. This one is lighter than air. I came into the world as a fist of cells, a pebble, aware of its weight, even as it floated in a night sea. And part of me remains in the dark, astonished by the life I find myself in its cities, its lights, swift travel, love, lies, heated rooms, and soft places to sleep. Where was I before? I watched my father relinquish in his 96th year whatever had anchored him to this world. The woods, the smell of motor oil, lake water, tools, the remembered taste of tobacco, leaving the weight of what he would be after fire changed bone to something like sand and the rest had moved somewhere else. Somewhere else. I think I've been a boulder in other lives, harder to move than I am in this one. Perhaps I'll be finer in my next. At times, I can almost silence the goings on in my head, noise of here and now, a granular frequency that may not be all, but is mostly what I hear. I would like to know what my father saw while I sat beside him and breath and warmth left his body imperceptibly with surprising gentleness, as though a feather had passed over us both. I would like to know if it changed me too, but for now I remain a handful of something hard thrown against glass. Someday ash, most of which will sink into the soil it came from, and a trace of which may float if I keep asking into mist, then air, then something thinner. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Leslie Allman. And um, I hope someday I can get you to sign my book <laughs> and Absolutely. your new collection as well. I'm really astonished by your images and um, it's live. So the cat on the left was totally, totally <laughs> part of the experience. The times, of, the times that we're in have required all of us, the image that, I love that line, tenacious as tar. I'll never forget thinking about tar that way ever again. I love this reading so much today. Um, I hope that we can have the four of you back for an encore. I think everyone would agree that we will, why not? Um, I would love to just have everyone in mute and do a little applause and then I'll come back with a few announcements. So, unmute. Hey. Yeah. Great. So good. Great. Awesome. So good. So good. Thank you all. We have, this is the first time that we've been had the audience here live with us in Zoom. How fun was this? And we've been going live to Facebook. You all have been watching Cultivating Voices Live Poetry's new book showcase today with Susan Eisenberg, Hilda Raz, Betsy Scholl, and Leslie Ullman. I hope you all consider joining us in the poetry, the Zoom poetry studio, as I'm going to start calling it. Next Sunday, we have a special event, a reading to celebrate the fall release 
of Pratik, a magazine of contemporary poetry with editor Yuyutsu Sharma and 20 poets from around the world. And a reminder that if you are a member of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, you can request a new books showcase reading and even pitch a special event. Well, we'll and looking ahead two weeks from today, we will have our final reading of November, another new book showcase with Jan Beatty, Don Krieger, and Lauren Russell. That'll be on Sunday, November 29th to round out the month. Our next live poetry open mic will be on December 6th. A very good week to all of you. Please stay safe. We know things here, at least in the US are surging, but that's happening all around the world. Take good care of yourselves and your beloveds, which of course means wearing your masks. And as I always say, Kate, please keep writing. Look what happens when we do that. All right, all. I believe this will be the end of our live stream. And I thank you and see you next time.